So this is an extremely important result for main sequence stars. Okay. So we've determined the temperatures of stars from their spectra, the distances from the parallax, the luminosity from a measurement of the distance and the apparent brightness, the mass from um, binary stars, the radius using L equals 4 pi r squared sigma t to the fourth. So now let's see if there's any trends. So here's a table of main sequence stars and their properties. Do not memorize this table, but look at the trends. As you go from O through M or even L, the mass goes down in units of solar masses. O-type stars are 40. M-type stars might be a fifth. Okay? The temperature goes from hot to cool. The radius goes from big to small. But all these col columns here don't vary a huge amount. I mean, that's a factor of a couple of hundred from from one extreme to another. That's a factor of around 17 or so from one extreme to another. That's a factor of around 50 or so from one extreme to another. But look at the luminosity. Holy cow, they go from half a million solar luminosities to one one hundredth or so. The luminosity spans a much bigger range because the luminosity is proportional to the square of the radius and to the fourth power of the temperature. So luminosity varies. Um, the sun is a pretty typical star. It's a G2 star. Um, it's sort of in the middle of this range. Actually, stars more massive are pretty rare. Our sun is sort of, it's by no means the most massive star, but it's on the upper end of things. Stars are actually less massive than our sun. The majority of stars are actually M stars, little M dwarfs, and there are some K stars as well. So our, but still, our sun can be considered a garden variety star. So the important point is, is that there's, there's physics that governs these various variables. Um, main sequence O stars are massive, but they are not small for whatever reason. They're also not low luminosity. M stars are small, but they're not big. They're not luminous, okay? So, I mean, M stars are cool, but they're not big. They're not luminous. So there's some physical relationships that must be governing what these stars are like and what they're doing. Now, when you look at a table like this, and you look at all the formulas that we've been going through the past week or so in trying to derive the various aspects of stars and show you how it's done, the how of this course is as important as the why or, or uh, as important as the results, you might think, oh, man, this is just such tedium, you know? This is just such awful stuff. And, in fact, there's this famous poem by Walt Whitman, let me read it to you. When I heard the learned astronomer, right? When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick till, rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Now, I know what Whitman is feeling, you know, but I would say that, you know, there can be bad lectures in just about any uh, course, right? Just about any field of, of human endeavor. You can hear a really tedious, awful, poorly presented, poorly motivated lecture. This is not something that's unique to science. And in fact, I would say that the numbers, the tables, and the physical that under understanding that can come from them lead, at least to me and to many people that I know, certainly all scientists that I know, a greater sense of beauty and awe and wonder about to a lessening of those feelings. Okay. Now, you can lose sight of the big picture when you look at all the tables and numbers and formulas and all that. But if you don't lose sight of the big picture, if instead you use that to come to an understanding of what the stars are and why galaxies exist and all that, to me that enhances the beauty of the object. Part of the mystery is still there. Why are there laws of physics at all? Why does it all come together in such a beautiful, marvelous, complex way? It need not have been that way. Okay? Alter the laws of physics or even the constants of nature a little bit and you end up with a rather 
uninteresting, stillborn universe. And it's just amazing to me that the universe is interesting. So to give you an example, I know what comets are and what produces them. Hopefully you do too. Does that detract from the beauty and awe and sense of wonder that I feel when I view a bright, beautiful comet? No, it doesn't. To some extent, I feel more in awe of it because I understand what it is. It is not an object that's completely unknown and to be feared. I understand it. Or a rainbow. I enjoy the beauty of a rainbow just as much as everyone does or anyone does, but I understand how it occurs, the detailed physics of why you get a rainbow or even a double rainbow sometimes. Does knowledge detract from a sense of beauty and wonder? To me, it doesn't. So I think that Whitman simply had a poor lecture in astronomy. So when you look at these things, the, the, you know, not like Nicholas say, okay? When you look at these things, don't focus on the small stuff. The big picture is that, as I've been saying, there must be some reason that this all is the way it is. And by playing with the numbers and the equations and stuff, we can figure out why the stars are as they are. And then when we look at them with wonder and awe in the sky, we can say, ah, but my brain actually understands something about those little points of light. Okay? So that's, that's my feeling, you know. We can understand these relationships and, in a sense, increase, not decrease, our, our sense of awe and wonder about the universe.